Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Pamela All on managing conflict in a world adrift. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. I'm David Welch, CG Chair of Global Security at the Balsley School of International Affairs and a senior fellow here at the Center for International Governance Innovation. And every week we're pleased to welcome a guest into the studio here at CG to talk about some timely and important topic on the global agenda. And today my guest is Pamela All, who's a senior fellow at CG as well as a senior advisor for conflict prevention and management at the United States Institute for Peace in Washington, D.C. Welcome to CG and welcome to Waterloo. Well, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be back here again. Yes, and may it be the, the next in a series <laughs> of many. Uh, but today we're talking about managing conflict in a world adrift, which uh, not coincidentally is the title of a major publication uh, just recently issued by CG and USIP. Mm -hmm. um, this impressive <laughs> volume of which uh, you're one of the three editors with Chester Crocker and uh, Fen Hampson. And it's really quite a comprehensive, bold attempt to take on the topic of managing conflict in the modern, rapidly changing world. And it's just the next in a series of these volumes that you have done with your colleagues. So perhaps if we could start by you giving us a little bit of background on where this project started, the idea, where it came from, and uh, what the earlier volumes tried to do and how the new one differs in particular, how it's uh, more reflective of the modern world. I'd be happy to uh, give you a little history. Um, Fen Hampson um, has been involved with these books from the beginning. He was a fellow at uh, USIP in the early 90s. And I was uh, newly on staff there. And we um, put our heads together and thought, wouldn't it be great to have a new teaching text for what was to us then a rapidly changing world, uh, not unlike the rapidly changing world today, because uh, it was right after the end of the Cold War. Uh, the um, discipline of political science had been turned on its head because we had moved from a world of, of uh, bipolar uh, relations and superpower rivalry to a world where um, new countries were springing up every day and we knew very little about them. And so it was a time in which things seemed a bit out of control. Uh, we thought it would be great to have a text that would help new teachers or even established teachers uh, figure out a little bit about how they were going to approach the subject matter. At the same time, uh, the head of the board of USIP at that time, Chester Crocker, who had been at the State Department and um, uh, was then and is now a professor at Georgetown, um, felt that it would be great to be able to put some of USIP's work together between two um, binders in some sort of book form. Mm -hmm. The three of us got together and um, uh, the result of that was the first book, which was called Managing Global Chaos. <laughs> so we've gone from managing the chaos to a world adrift. It and sounds like progress to me. It may be progress, but it has been an interesting and, and a rocky ride. Um, so the first book really focused on what is the nature of this new world and um, what can one do at all to manage it. Management is one of those words that um, gets, it's like a burr under the saddle. It gets people mad, particularly mm -hmm. when it comes to conflict because uh, really people sort of read into it, oh, all you're going to do is stop the fighting, keep the parties suppressed in some ways, and just keep doing whatever it was you wanted to do anyway. Management is something that's often seen as um, the preferred policy of the, um, of the powerful nations of the world. You know, let's organize the world the way we want to organize it, keep people down, and we'll all be better off. We don't see management in that light at all. Mm -hmm. For us, management is really a kind of um, portmanteau word. Mm 
one that would um, have in it prevention, management in the in the smaller sense, stopping the fighting, um, you know, starting a political process, resolution, meaning how do you get to settlement, um, and increasingly uh, over the the period that this series came out, we started to focus on post-conflict what was originally called post-conflict reconstruction and is now uh, looked at as transformation um, and heading towards reconciliation. So we um, took this word management and tried to broaden its sense and we still feel that when we're, we're talking about conflict management. Um, so we were managing global chaos. Um, concepts of mediation, negotiation, track two diplomacy, meaning diplomacy or, or, or um, conflict mitigation that's done by um, NGOs, uh, were quite new. Mm -hmm. It's a young field. Conflict resolution is a young field. And in the early 90s, those people who were in school studying it understood it. But it wasn't part of the general parlance. Um, so that was the function of the first book. Let's map it, this field out and let people understand what the um, options were mm -hmm. for managing conflict. So several years went by and we started to see um, a, just a great amount of um, attempts and often quite successful attempts on the part of the UN and others to bring conflicts to a close. So uh, we saw the end of the war in Bosnia, Cambodia, um, all sorts of places. Um, often these were mediated endings. The Bosnian mediation was a very forceful mediation mm -hmm. and many people would say no, that's not a good example. Um, but we considered it as part of the spectrum of what a third party, somebody from the outside, could do to uh, resolve a conflict. On the other side of the spectrum was the work that, the, um, that George Mitchell and his two um, companions, one of whom, Canadian General de Chastelain, um, did in Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. And where they basically listened to people for what seems like several years before the process moved to a uh, resolution. So that was the other side of the spectrum. And uh, really, by the end of the 90s, we started to feel we really do understand this new field of peacekeeping, peacemaking, and peace building. These terms were the terms used mm -hmm. by um, uh, the Secretary General of the UN at the time, Boutros uh, Ghali. And um, to define the field, we thought we understood them. Things seemed to be working. The UN was, you know, a, a very respected institution. Everybody wanted it involved in their conflict. Um, conflicts were, were, were ending. Um, we thought we understood peacekeeping and maybe even understood peace enforcement when you start using a little bit more force. Mm -hmm. So, we started another book to capture what we had learned in the 1990s. The title of that book um, is Turbulent Peace. So we went from managing conflict, ca uh, chaos to a turbulent peace. We also sounds like progress. It, we really thought it was progress, right. and it was progress. I mean, the 1990s was a kind of remarkable period for right. understanding the dynamics of, of uh, conflict resolution. The book was published in September 2001. Mm, good time. And um, uh, practically immediately, we had the, um, the uh, events of, of September 11th, 2001, 9-11. Um, and it threw the whole field into another period of uh, searching for answers. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, in the next, not decade, but 
more than a decade, um, the United States has been at war. Um, the United States and its allies, but um, just speaking as an American, my country has been at war in ways that it hadn't been uh, since World War II. Mm -hmm. So, um, but this was a, a different kinds of wars. This was, um, you know, invasions of, um, in Afghanistan's uh, case, of a, um, a state that hadn't really formed itself as a state. Um, and in Iraq, it was a very strong state structure, but which didn't amount to um, anything more than a very a strong uh, authoritarian government. So um, here we found ourselves in a very different world. I mean, to talk about peacekeeping, peacemaking, peace building in the early 2000s um, was quite difficult. No one wanted to hear it. And so, but we felt it was important to, again, capture the lessons, the conflict management lessons of um, a world much more at war. Um, and so over the next um, seven years, six, seven years, um, we started on the third book, which is called Leashing the Dogs of War. So here again, a third in the series, still talking about mediation, negotiation, track to diplomacy, what you could do to build civil society, but in a different context, and that is context of, of a very unsettled world and a, uh, what unfortunately seemed to be a growing division uh, among parts of the world. Um, Leashing the Dogs of War came out in 2007, and um, there was a moment when we thought this may be our last book. Um, it's, it's, uh, we've said a great deal, um, and not we, but the people in the book have said a great deal about the field of conflict resolution, conflict management. We've covered three very different periods. Um, perhaps this will be our last book. Um, but then again, we, we kept on feeling that the environment um, had changed sufficiently so that we needed to take another look at, at um, the field of conflict resolution, and this time really in the context of a world in which the major institutions were drawing back from a robust role in managing conflict however you want to define that, that uh, term. Um, and that power was being dispersed. So where we may have started out the decade of uh, 1990, um, feeling like, oh, our world has come apart because the two, they're, no, you know, they're not two global superpowers anymore, there's just one, and um, you know, the whole structure has fallen apart. By um, 2010, 2011, we were starting to feel we actually need to think again about how you manage conflict in a world in which there's a lot of poles of power. And in fact, there are a lot of people who are quite powerful who are not states, who are not uh, traditionally acted in this area. So that's where we come to um, managing conflict in a world adrift. Um, progress is probably not the word to use. It is an attempt here to capture the conflict environment or the global environment in which conflict management is taking place. So it's a long um, uh, sort of journey through our intellectual development and our growing understanding of um, this field. By the way, I do have to point out that you wrote um, uh, one of the two introductory chapters to this new book, and in that chapter that you wrote, uh, you've captured this new world um, and the field of conflict resolution and its development. 
very well. Oh, kind of you to say. <laughs> <laughs> I did my best. Now, looking back on these series of uh, books and series of epics that they're treating, uh, do you think there are lessons that carry over? Or do you think uh, we just live in a world in which we face a certain kind of era, a certain situation, we learn how to cope with it, and then boom, something happens, we find ourselves in another context and we have to start all over again relearning how to manage what are fundamentally different kinds of conflicts? Um, I think we've, we have learned a great deal that we continue to use. And um, if you think today about how mediation is almost the first port of call in a conflict event. Um, it's very different from the way the world was in the early 1990s. Mediation has become a tool which the parties understand a great deal better, the parties to the conflict. They know there's a possibility that they could um, ask the UN, ask the African Union, you know, ask uh, an eminent person to come in and help them sort through their problems. Um, a lot more institutions are offering mediation and doing it well. So I think we've learned a huge amount about how to talk through the issues of a conflict, how to negotiate, um, what roles different institutions should play. I think the, um, the interaction between what we've learned and the, the, um, the challenges of applying it to new uh, situations, um, uh, that is, uh, is something that I think we learn as we understand the new situation. We don't change the way we understand uh, mediation necessarily because it's a new situation, but we may change where we practice it, who practices it, how we back them up. Um, we're not developing a completely new approach for which there's no word right. to manage these situations. We're still using words. We're still trying to bring parties together. So in that way, I think we've, we've uh, learned a lot of lessons. We've also learned lessons about the difficulty of using force in a conflict situation so that you don't have as much um, well, you have a lot of debate over the use of force but you have a lot more understanding of the costs of the use of force. Right. Um, certainly in the United States um, in the 1990s I think um, uh, we were uncertain about the role that force uh, uh, played in peace building but we got used to it. We got used to it, and by the time you know uh, Richard Holbrook was was um, the American diplomat was um, mediating in quotes uh, the end of the war in Bosnia, um, and uh, force was used to to soften soften um, some of the parties. I think we were fairly comfortable with it. Um, I think in the decade of the 2000s, I've never known quite what to call mm -hmm. that first decade. Anyway, that first decade um, of the 21st, myself, yeah. <laughs> 21st century, um, I think we started to understand the true, you know, personal cost of, um, <coughs> of war. And it brought it home to Americans in a way that we hadn't felt uh, on a personal basis for a long time since, mm -hmm. since the Vietnam War. Right. I'm interested in the global governance institutions mm -hmm. angle here mm -hmm. uh, because you talked about the immediate post-Cold War period being one in which there was a certain amount of enthusiasm, almost euphoria in some sense for uh, the first George Bush said, a, a new world order in which he seemed to think the United Nations would play a prominent mm -hmm. role and other regional security organs too, and, and you're quite right, I think, to point to the retreat of these organizations now, and they're not the go-to venue anymore. 
One of the books uh, you mentioned, uh, the third in the series, Leashing the Dogs of War, I'm sure you know that was an image people used to, to describe the task of the League of Nations mm -hmm. in 1919 uh, 19 when it was created to leash the dogs of war. Right. There's a, there's a pessimistic way of looking at all that, which is obvious from the description of the retreat of these institutions. There's an optimistic way of looking at it, which is to say that these are institutions essentially designed to deal with the problem of interstate war. And when you look at the figures, lo and behold, we seem to be doing pretty well uh, mm -hmm. in the battle against yeah. interstate war. There are fewer of them. They tend to last a shorter amount of time, and they tend to be less deadly uh, in the grand scheme of things. Um, so maybe the fact that they're not the go-to institutions now is a sign of success. Um, but that would leave open the question, who are the go-to institutions for the sub-state wars, the sort of regional transnational wars, the wars in which there, there are technically state borders, but the states are largely failed, and so the right. states themselves don't seem to have much of a role. What's your read on the governance, the appropriate governance responses to this new world? This is certainly new and different and, and challenging and uh, almost chaotic. I almost thought you were going to say that you should have reused that title <laughs> from, yeah. from the first book to describe the yeah. current world. No, the adrift really refers to just what you talked about, which is the, the pulling back right. of the traditional um, leaders in the conflict management world. Um, and they may not pull back for long. I mean, the one thing you do learn in this field, as you well know, is you never make hard and fast rules because things right. change and institutions that you thought were gone right. are back. And NATO was supposed to die. Right. After after the end of the Cold War, and uh, yes, I never it found, bet money. <laughs> it found a new mission, so um, it seems now that there is a retrenchment of the principal institutions, but uh, regional organizations are getting much more active. Um, but I don't think you can just leave the business of managing conflict to somebody, you know, to regional organizations, to um, the UN, even to the, you know, the French or the Americans or whatever. Um, I think we have, what we have really started to understand is that we've all got to be in this together. So what we need to do is perhaps redefine our roles and uh, figure out who's on first. Who takes the first step? If you have an internal conflict in Africa, should you be invited in only by a regional organization in Africa or a continental organization like the African Union? We didn't necessarily think we had to be invited in. We were reluctant to go in, but we didn't look around and say, um, somebody needs to invite us into uh, a conflict zone. Um, the UN has to respond if a party asks them to play a role. So that was being invited, but it was being invited by a party. Um, so I think what we could think of is maybe there is a kind of order of this governance structure that we're still working towards. Mm -hmm. That there is a need for legitimacy in order to be effective as a conflict manager. Where do you get that legitimacy from? The UN had it because it was the global membership institution. Mm -hmm. Practically everybody belonged. And actions taken on behalf of the UN were taken on behalf of this large membership. That's, it's, it's not clear. I think it still plays that role. But it's not clear that it doesn't need a, you know, a partner now on the ground with which it will work. So I think the governance structure, I, I, you know, sort of watch this space. I think it's going to be really interesting to see how institutions um, decide to act together. Um, or, you know, perhaps decide that actually uh, 
Um, uh, on the regional scale, we, the African Union, um, ECOWAS, whoever it is, can manage this one. We don't need outside help. So even though you're anxious to come in, you know, mm. we will manage this, right. this uh, uh, conflict. So I think there's going to be a conversation <clears throat> over this. Now, there, there are at least two arguments that would suggest that we would be in better shape from a global governance of conflict perspective if either or both of two things had happened. One is if the authority structure at the United Nations had been updated. It's no longer 1945, and right. we don't have the right permanent members anymore when you look at actual capabilities and so on. So it's getting anachronistic. And the other one is it was working pretty well until the United States basically mm -hmm. broke it by... First of all, a bait and switch in Afghanistan, turning a sort of a generally approved targeted hit on the infrastructure of Al Qaeda into a wholesale let's reinvent Afghanistan effort. And then what many people around the world saw as a, an unjustified, almost gratuitous um, invasion of Iraq, which was widely interpreted as a deliberate um, body blow to the UN and its um, moral authority, its capacity to authorize those sorts of things. So I'm wondering, it's hard to do the thought experiment, but you know, if, if those two things, <laughs> or either I'd or both <laughs> of those two things uh, had been happen. different, um, do you think we would yeah. be like well ahead of this now, that we would have global conflict in, in good order? Or do you think it's likely that um, we just would be dealing with a different set of problems? Well, Afghanistan and Iraq were two very different conflicts, and so I, I don't, I don't um, uh, agree uh, fully with the, particularly the characterization of Afghanistan. The problem with Afghanistan is that we got into Iraq. Um, I think I if we had stayed focused, and I mean, this is not a new thought, we had stayed focused and um, with the UN, and the UN has played a very, very uh, strong role in Afghanistan, if we'd stayed focused with the UN, you know, yes, perhaps that would have ended differently. But we didn't. We had Iraq, and I agree, it's almost as though we were um, shutting the, uh, the world body out. Uh, and of course, um, you know, it had its terrible disaster there. Um, would it, would we, be in a much more peaceful world. Probably, if we were, it would not have been because of global governance. Um, we have been fighting, um, you know, fairly strenuously in the Middle East, one of the most turbulent zones, and a zone that is in itself going through tremendous um, transitions um, for 15 years. I think that's, uh, you know, where the, the, the strains are coming from. Um, and it's not clear to me they, they, they weren't there anyway. You know, you look at the beginning of Al-Qaeda and it was against uh, what it saw as these very, uh, you know, repressive governments, not that it was a democratic institution, but it did not like the governments in <laughs> the Middle East. So there was a, a fight uh, going on anyway. Um, Saudi Arabia is one of the U.S.'s strongest allies. Had, you know, had it been another, uh, another trajectory, I can see us still coming in, you know, protecting Saudi Arabia, protecting Israel. So um, it, it, it's, it's hard to say we would, have, right. we would have come out the right side of this one. Um, and a lot not, of moving pieces, aren't there? It's not clear where, you know, I, it, it, you know we're talking about it in moral terms, and, and war is awful. Right. Um, but we're obviously in a huge global transition. And it's hard to see where we're going from where we are, you know, standing up close right. to it. 
but it may be a transition that needs to happen. And it may be a transition that empowers people on the ground everywhere. Uh, it may be just be a much more, um, as we say in the book, distributed um, uh, sort of system of governance where everybody can feel a little bit more empowered than they are today. But that's a huge challenge to the powers that be, um, and there is going to be conflict over that kind of transformation. Right. Well, that's a great overview of the project and the history <laughs> of the series of the projects, and thank you so much for coming in and doing that for us. And I, I should say to the audience that uh, the book itself very rich, very detailed, uh, very careful treatments of specific issues and specific areas, and uh, really quite a masterful accomplishment. So congratulations on it, and I would encourage anyone who's interested in understanding conflict uh, management better to pick up a copy. Uh, so thank you for coming in, Pamela. Thank, thank you, you to our audience for joining us. Please join us again next week for another episode of Inside the Issues, the CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube.